I'm a, one of the co-founders at SaneBox. Uh, we are a uh, cloud service that filters out and summarizes unimportant emails. Uh, had another startup before that, and before that I spent seven years at Overture and Yahoo, and before that I did investment banking for a couple of years as well. So, Sweet. Um, my background actually, for the longest time I never told people what I did from ages 13 to 21 or whatever, um, but my background's from the underbelly of the internet, so affiliate marketing. Um, basically what we do is we try to not scam people, but um, figure out <laughs> interesting ways to get leads to them and in the process we've you know I've helped get uh, over a hundred million customers and users for different brands like Zynga, eHarmony uh, and the likes. And today I'm the founder of Fiveby which is a video concierge. Today we're, he we're here to talk about growth hacking or I mean what that means why and, and why it's stupid. Why it's stupid. Um, how to get users to whatever it is you're doing, how to get customers, how to make money. Um, this is a no bullshit talk. Um, most people do talks on growth hacking and they give conceptual, this is what is growth hacking, this is why you should do it. Uh, what my goal and Dimitri's goal here is to basically leave you with actionable, you know, this is how I can make money, this is how I can get users and like get started right away. And we're available after the... Uh, after the talk as well to, yep. to chat more. And we're also gonna take some time at the end uh, to take some questions and actually get somebody on stage and be your kind of part-time CMOs for five minutes and do maybe a case study on, one, on somebody's uh, business here. So start thinking about the questions you wanna ask us. Um, before, we, before we jump in, just a very high level kind of conceptual talk uh, before we get to the tactics. Uh, so growth hacking is not new, right? It's, the term was invented uh, a year or two ago, but it really has been around for a very long time. Um, and one of the ways to think about it is, so if you look at the products which had kind of a hockey stick growth right, over the years, they've been around for a very long time as well. One of my favorite example is, uh, examples is Tupperware. Thanks. So um, uh, Tupperware is, uh, what's interesting about it is it was a product that was originally being sold like a regular uh, you know, dishes at the store. So they shipped them to the stores and they just weren't selling. Um, Post-war America, right? Uh, soldiers are back from the, uh, from the war and they go into, into the, uh, the dish store to buy regular porcelain stuff and they see this plastic which doesn't, you know, nobody knows what that is. And so somebody came up with the idea of doing a Tupperware party which, is, which was a completely novel idea at the time, right? And the rest is history, it's hockey stick growth. So it's a completely new channel for a completely new product. And so one of the things that we're going to talk about is the fact that what growth hacking really is, it's finding, it's basically the medium is the message, right? So whatever message you're trying to, to send, it has to be given in the context of the medium which is selling it. So again, think Tupperware, uh, Tupperware party, Facebook games, Facebook platform, and so on and so on. And, and the beauty about growth hacking today is, it's basically like we have Tupperware um, with crack essentially in them because we could be, um, you know, it's all on steroids, um, the scale is massive and that's why there's huge opportunities today. So this is a framework that was uh, originally introduced by Dave McClure, so we're stealing a little bit from him. But if you think about your kind of your growth and your, your business model, there are five kind of levels. Um, you need to acquire users, you need to make sure they convert, so that's acquisition, activation. You need to make sure they stay, retention, uh, and you need to ideally make sure they invite their friends, referral, and obviously monetize them revenue. Uh, so depending on your business, you, might, you don't necessarily need all of these, and you might need to add some others, but this is a very good kind of starting point to think about it. Um, we also want to add a couple of kind of add-ons to Dave's uh, uh, framework. Again, it depends, right? So it's, if, you're, if you're not focused on revenue, then obviously revenue is not a, uh, a metric you should optimize. Yeah, and you know, I think a great example of that is, do you guys know Branch Out? It's like a LinkedIn for Facebook. Um, they basically were able to raise you know, to the tune of like $100 million because they optimize for acquisition. So basically they did some spammy shit to help get a bunch of users um, and they weren't really engaged users at all, actually, but they did it right before funding rounds. So the idea was funding is all about telling an amazing story, 
and they wanted to optimize for, we created this thing and it's really sexy, it's LinkedIn for Facebook, this and that, and uh, we're gonna throw a million users a day at it and that's why you should invest. Uh, the problem was those, those, those users actually never ended up being engaged users and it was almost like a Ponzi scheme they found out, but I think the lesson there is yeah, optimize, you know, what is your goal? Is your goal to raise money? If so, maybe you shouldn't be focusing on revenue or something like that. Maybe you should be focusing on how to tell a better story. Maybe you just want to make money and that's what you want to focus on. You want to spam the shit out of people. If that, you pro I'm probably the guy you want to speak to. Um, <laughs> I just blew him away, literally. <laughs> Um, well, so, and to, to that point, one of your key jobs as a uh, co-founder or CEO <laughs> is to, to sit and not fall from a chair and uh, to set the, set the key metrics uh, for the company. And by metrics, goals and key, kind of corresponding metrics to, uh, to measure those goals um, and allocate resources to them. Um, so now we're going to switch from this high-level BS to something more actionable and talk about actual hacks for each of those um, segments of the funnel. I also, I also want to say that I have never been to a growth hacking talk where people have actually said, okay, these are the hacks that we use to get millions of users or whatever it is. Um, people, you know, we're actually giving away our secret sauce, something that growth hackers no, no longer do, so um, get ready. We're going to save a couple for, for ourselves, but you'll get most of it. Um, so, this is kind of a, a relatively novel topic. Uh, obviously, the landing pages have been around for a long time, uh, but what's, what you can do now is serve different, uh, different landing page depending on source of traffic, right? Wh whether or not you control the, the URL. So, if somebody searches for your brand term on Google and come to your site, obviously the experience should be very different than if they search for a product you sell. Right, so they already know what they're, you can just basically think of them as lower in the funnel since they already know who you are. One of the right. things I would encourage you guys to do, and this is gonna sound really strange, but I'd encourage you guys to take 30 minutes tonight, um, go back to your apartments, hotels, whatever, and watch, uh, well basically go through the funnel of watching pornography. Um, and the reason why is the porn guys ha do it the best. Um, they've nailed down these funnels to a science. And you're laughing. You're laughing, but Julian agrees too. Claude agrees. But they've spent, why spend the millions and millions of dollars to figure out how, you know. How, yeah, Man, yeah, Manwin's a Montreal company, which owns about 95% of the adult space. They literally have an SEO department of 70 people and a PPC department of 30 people. And these guys are the best in the business. And if you look at how they optimize for PPC, serve different landing pages, it's really, you know, they really are at the bleeding edge. And a lot of, uh, a lot of actually what start, you know, a lot of, I mean, no one talks about it, and this is what this talk is for. This is a talk about the growth hacks that no one talks about. And a lot of the big startups um, that, you, you know, you guys use have actually looked at that industry and built stuff around it. So, I would say watch some porn. <laughs> Um, so the, the second one is kind of a, a broad topic. Um, back to the point about medium being the message. Um, there are, this doesn't happen every day, but every couple of months there's something new that happens in the internet space, right? Uh, Vine, Instagram video, uh, but even kind of, it's important to keep your, the, your uh, hand on the pulse because, for example, Twitter recently released a new ad format where you can target followers Right? And for us, it's the best converting, uh, one of the best converting channels. So what we do is we have some testimonial from, say, Robert Scoble. Right? So we put this in the tweet, and we target that, that ad to followers of Scoble. Right? And we obviously we have a tracking URL we can, we can measure, and that works really, really well. But that's relatively new. It wasn't really in the news, so you kind of really have to keep an eye on it. Yeah, so I think the learning there is always keep, you know, always, I guess, keep, you know, look out for new things and ask yourself, you know, okay, Twitter, you know, unreaches a new ad platform. What does this mean for my business? How could I take advantage of it? It's like putting yourself, like, that's why I always think that you guys should, you know, I, you know, I spend a lot of time with founders, you know, venture-backed CEOs, and they're just like, 
you know, oh, startup is this like romantic sort of thing, but like put your growth hacking hat on, put your like scummy affiliate marketing hat on, and say how could I best utilize this new platform to basically uh, build my brand, sell my product, get users, whatever it is. And I think like, um, you know, the same thing happened with Facebook ad platform. When the Facebook ad platform um, came out um, in 2007, that like unleashed thousands and thousands of millionaires who built products around the Facebook ad platform. Um, so the, you know, the key is to obviously look at when these new things come out and ask yourself these questions. Yeah. Well, so one of the other kind of hacks that we found within Facebook, and again, uh, you should be, if you want a growth hack, you should be prepared to do things that other people wouldn't. Right? Right. So kind of put your moral code aside a little bit. Oh. Just a little bit. Watch some porn and then put your moral code aside. <laughs> so one of the things that we did was uh, we wanted to get customers at Fortune uh, 500 companies. So we literally created, we, we, we got the logos from Fortune 500 companies. One of the things you can do on Facebook is target employees of any, any company, right? So we started targeting them um, just by pay. You know, put the, the picture of our, put our logo or something related to our product, which is email, um, and targeted those people. Didn't work at all. Then we added the logo of the company that we're targeting to it. The click-through rate just skyrocketed, right? People see their company, oh, so I think the tagline was too much email at company X. Crazy. Uh, we got, I think, four C and Ds from cease and desist letters from the lawyers of those companies eventually, uh, but not until we got a few users. And another example um, would be uh, you know, targeting, for example, we're a, kind of like a songs up for video or, you know, a video site and, and uh, you know, we would target people like fans of Ellie Golding. So we, we know that they like Ellie Golding and there's millions of, of people that do. And we basically would say, do you like Ellie Golding in the title? Obviously, they like Ellie Golding. And then we would link it to a video that's an Ellie Golding video and that would bring these people into our funnel. Um, at a cheap cost, because the way the way Facebook ad platform works is, the higher your click-through rate, um, basically the more leverage you have with them, um, so you can decrease the cost. And it's actually a weird concept. You know, you think that like, well, they're driving more clicks. Well, you know, why would why would they want to decrease your cost? But the reason why they do it is, um, you know, basically your target your target your ads are relevant to to the users and. Um, it's also a CPC basis, so you're, you're in, in the long run, Facebook's going to make more money out of you. Um, do you want to talk about StumbleUpon? Oh, yeah. Um, so um, I've been using, well, using StumbleUpon the last five years since they released their paid advertising platform. Um, you know, that's just a good example of you know, a platform that for five cents a click, you can actually manufacture a lot of growth for consumer web products. Um, so basically, I don't know if you guys know stumble upon works, but the way you pick your interest and then you can kind of just stumble through content. Um, and uh, basically what you can do is uh, try to create engaging stumble upon content specifically for stumble upon. So with us, for example, um, again, we're like a video concierge service. So what we did is we, we literally took our concierge um, and put it on stumble upon. And because it's so interactive, um, we just got a ton of, ton of activations. So, I mean, don't look, don't look at like all the regular channels like your Googles and your Facebook. Look at like kind of third tier or second tier um, social networks. StumbleUpon's great for that. Reddit is really great for that. Um, and that sort of thing, so. But again, it really depends. And we'll, we'll, t we'll look through actually our, our company dashboard, uh, our marketing dashboard later. But it's one of the things, we've tried StumbleUpon, uh, paid stumbles as well, didn't work for us at all. So uh, one of the key things is you have to try a lot of stuff and see what sticks. And, I, and don't be afraid to spend some money. Uh, set a budget that you can fail with, right? And if you fail, it's OK. Uh, but you'll, you'll probably find out of 10 things that you try, maybe one that really works. But that's all you need. Um, so email marketing, obviously everyone knows it. Uh, does everyone fam is everyone familiar with Tout app or Yesware, those, those kinds of tools? Yep. Um, so it's. Um, a platform for sending out a lot of emails and being really smart about it. So you can track click-through rate, open rate. Um, you can kind of segment it, but different subject lines, different messages, and so on and so on. Uh, so one of the things that we've learned is when you send out a lot of emails, uh, let's say you're sending an email to 1,000 people, uh, create 10 different subject lines right, and, and optimize not only for open rates, but 
click-through rates, ultimately conversion rates. And you can, you can track a lot. So I highly recommend if you send email to anyone, tout app, that's what we use ourselves. Um, so let's move on to activation hacks. So uh, this, I don't, uh, you, many of you probably know this. Uh, so one of Facebook's kind of early learnings was that in order for a, a user to become engaged and stay, they had to get seven friends within 10 days. Uh, so they looked at their, their data and that's what they found. So we're doing the same thing our, ourselves. So for us, uh, the key kind of factor for engagement is number one, how many emails the person gets per day. And number two, how many of our features they're using. And there are specific features that, uh, that convert better. So we're optimizing our activation funnel to drive people through, through those features. Actually, I really like how Twitter calls that. Uh, they, you know, I was meeting with Twitter, um, actually it was last year, um, and they, um, they actually call it their aha moment. I thought that was interesting. Yeah. So it's like, what is the, you know, for Twitter, I don't remember exactly, but I think it's like after 10 followers, people generally stick around with the product. You know, 10 followers in like 14 days, people generally stick around with the product, they get the value, et cetera. So it's like, what's your aha moment? You know, what is it gonna take for your users to be like, wow, this is an app that, you know, I could see myself using on a daily, a daily basis. And if you're not, if you're a venture-backed startup and you're not creating something that isn't, be, you know, to be used on a daily basis and you're a consumer, like, you know, you shouldn't be taking venture. That's like what you be, should be focusing on. Yeah. And the, kind of the key point here is you have to be really data centric for, for all of this stuff, right? So if you're, if you're not familiar with Excel, uh, you probably won't be a good data hacker. So like invest in, a, in an Excel course. Uh, not crazy stuff, but like you should be able to do some very basic data manipulation to figure out what works, what doesn't. What sort, of, what sort of stuff does um, Sanebox do in terms of uh, like exporting data? Uh, so we, we use a bunch of stuff from Google Analytics, Kissmetrics, our internal data. Uh, what, so my, my background is I'm a kind of analyst by trade, so I always go back to the data myself. Um, so the, uh, w what we like to do is pull everything in, into one Excel dashboard so everything is in one place. Like, I, I personally don't like going to Google Analytics because it's, like it's another thing to look at. You have to click a bunch of buttons. Uh, and the other problem with Google Analytics is uh, there's a gazillion things for you to look at. Right? You don't need a gazillion things. You need five things, right? five key metrics you optimize for. Um, if something is off in those five metrics, we're so what I do is export it into Excel and have a dashboard that I'm looking at once a week. Right? Not once a day, not, one, not twice a day, once a week. Um, if something is off, Right. If one of the metrics is off, uh, it requires digging in further, then that makes sense to go into analytics or uh, our internal data and figure it out. But you don't need to confuse yourself with a, uh, with a ton of data. I think it's really important. I just want to touch on this quickly. I think it's really important that you said weekly and not daily because uh, there's a lot of entrepreneurs who get too bogged down in the data, which is really bad. And they're just spending a couple hours a day just in the data, in the data. Um, you know, there has to be a f obviously a healthy balance you know, and, you know, between looking at data, using your gut, and building the product. But so one of the questions that we thought about is what day of the week should we look at the data, um, right? So normal people would probably say, like, Monday or Friday. So for us, we found that our most eventful day, days are Mondays and Tuesdays. Like, most of our conversions happen, but most of our traffic acquisition happens on Monday and Tuesday. So we look at the data at the end of Tuesday, right? So look at, look at your own metrics and figure out when you should be looking at it. Great fucking point. Um, all right, so should we move on to retention hacks? Sure, go ahead. Um, I think f for most companies, email, uh, <laughs> one of the main reasons our business is successful is because every single company uses email as a retention tool. Uh, and for a good reason, because it actually works, right? Inbox is the one place you always, you always look. Um, I guess the, one of the things we learned here is don't be afraid to be aggressive. Back to the, uh, the, your moral uh, code point. Um, for, we're very aggressive about sending follow-up emails, kind of, we call them nudge emails to get people to convert. Um, uh, we, we, we tried being less aggressive, more aggressive, and we ended up with more aggressive because for every, you know, every one, once a week somebody would complain, oh, you guys send me too many emails, you know, what the fuck, you're supposed to be an anti-email service. Uh, but our conversion rate is awesome. Uh, so uh, the trade-off is, you know, it's clear who's going to win there. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, yeah, I think, you know, in terms of mobile, I just want to touch upon that. I think um, a lot of people who are developing apps are having issues with retention. 
Um, and I think the key there, you know, beyond the email marketing and the value that your app's supposed to bring is, you know, how do you use push notifications in a way that isn't just brute force and un non contextual? So with us, for example, we have an app um, which is not launched, but you know, the first time we, we put it out in beta, we basically had a brute force push notification thing that said, your new videos are in, and you'd get it every day. And what people hated about that is it wasn't contextual. So you know, the key, you know, what we're building right now is like, um, you know, we, we're taking a lot of data in terms of what people click, in terms of like, make you laugh. You know, maybe people click make you laugh at 11.30 at night. So basically now we're sending, we're starting to send push notifications that say like, okay, we know that you, you know, click, you like funny videos at 11.30 p.m. Here's your, you know, your daily dose of funny videos. Like, here, you know, here it is. Um, so the key is, you know, on, on mobile is push notifications that are actually contextual. And I think that's, that's a very good segue to our next point. Uh, so the message has to go out at the right time, right, in the right context. So uh, switching to referral hacks, uh, one of the things that we found is uh, you, you have to make sure you're asking people to share at the right time when they're happy about your product, ideally. <laughs> uh, so one of the things, early on, we, we tried to optimize for a shorter uh, viral cycle. So we would ask people to share as soon as they sign up, right? So it's very quick. Uh, that was a mistake. A uh, better thing to do would be to ask them to share with, after 24 hours, right? Once they actually figure out how the product works and know what they're sharing. Um, the, the other thing that's really important, is one of the things we, we tried very recently, is uh, positioning, so sending out a survey, uh, asking, hey, how do you like our product? If they like the product a lot, that's when the call to action comes to you know, rate us in the app store, like us, send us to our, you know, share us with your friends. Um, if you do this prematurely, chances are you'll, you know, people won't share or will give you a bad review. Right? Yeah, so a couple of things I want to touch upon, which is, you know, is that like if you're creating an app, you know, key this the currency in, in the app world is five star ratings and your ratings in the iTunes store. That's gonna help propel your business. So any way you can hack that growth by doing stuff like um, you know so, some of that sort of stuff, and also like uh, you know, for example, only get people who are daily active users to rate your app. Why? Because these are the people that use your fucking app every day. And if they use it every day, then chances are that they're going to give you a high rating. So these are things that you should totally be thinking about. One of my favorite examples of, I guess, uh, you know, qualifying users, that sort of thing, um, is the Snapchat example. So like um, Snapchat invented, um, are you guys familiar with Snapchat? I feel like now I'm coming across as like <laughs> such a creepy person. <laughs> <laughs> um, so anyways, uh, Snapchat invented or was the first person to popularize find your friends. So before find, basically the way it works is you sign up to Snapchat, um, you would basically that had a step that said invite your friends and then you could send pictures. That's kind of how the, the, the service works. Um, they actually didn't see hockey stick growth um, until they changed um, that step to find your friends. Um, and why is that really important is that, you know, if you're finding your friends, it's like, okay, your friends are in this, like, place, and, like, you can go find them, and you, this service is going to be super valuable, that sort of thing. Now, invite your friends is kind of like someone's asking you to do something, and people don't like that. Um, we often think that we're, you know, we're technologists and that sort of thing, but at the end of the day, we're building products that have to adhere to how people think and that sort of thing. Um, so, um, yeah. Well, Another example of a of successful company that did something smart with this is Yammer. So Yammer's model is to get significant adoption of users within an enterprise and then go to their IT department and upsell them on a, in a corporate license. So uh, their kind of viral uh, page, uh, normally you're used to just seeing, you know, find your friends, enter, enter, enter an email address. Uh, so what they did is they, they uh, pre-filled the domain name of your company. So you're forced to invite your colleagues who work at your company. Right? So super small thing, but that, that made a big difference for them. So it's, again, the, all of this stuff is depending on your personal goals. And lastly, revenue hacks, before I think we go on to getting the audience involved. Yeah, so um, one of the things we found with revenue, and this is actually, you guys probably know this, so please stop me if this is not, not news. Uh, so framing the price point is really important. 
uh, people aren't uh, used to paying money online still, right? Uh, you don't mind going to Starbucks and paying five dollars for a coffee, but if it's a like a really good web service that's five bucks a month, you know, you, you think twice about it. Um, so what, one of the things we did is we actually named our price plans a snack plan, lunch plan, and dinner plan uh, to kind of frame frame in, in the person's mind that that's, you know, I'm, I'm just buying a snack. Uh, and that actually worked really well. Yeah, and I think that's brilliant. And I think where it comes from, one of, you know, one of the places where that comes from and, you know, one of the most brilliant, you know, marketing companies in the world is, a, you know, an organization called uh, Ch uh, Children's Christian Fund. Was it Children's Christian Fund? Yeah. yeah, so what they did, the smartest thing that they did was for less than a cup of coffee a day, you could save this, you know, starving African person. And ba that concept of less than a cup of coffee a day, like, you know, is what resonated with people. Well, it's only less, you know, I buy coffee five times a day. Therefore, it's less than a cup. How can I not, you know, do this? And I think, you know, that's a super smart tactic. Uh, we got into some trouble with, uh, with people in, in, I think, in India or some, some other developing countries. Like, what kind of a cup of coffee is five bucks? Uh, they weren't happy about that. Um, <laughs> Uh, last but not least, uh, so anchoring your pricing is very important. Um, so we used to, one of the things I have to share with everyone, and I see this every day with, uh, with my friends at different startups, people tend to underprice their products slash undervalue their products. Uh, don't be afraid to charge more money. So if you wanted your revenue to grow, let her charge more money. Uh, there is a, so what we did a few months ago, we used to have one pricing point. So $5 a month, or it was 55 a year. We decided to split it up into three price points, 39, 89, and 299. And we thought, and 299 is, you, you used to get for 55 uh, what you now pay 299 for. That's kind of the, the, the Cadillac plan. Uh, we thought nobody in their right mind would ever pay us 299 uh, ever. Uh, on day two, uh, we, we realized that 5% of our users buy the most expensive plan, 60% buy the middle plan, and 35 by the, the cheapest plan. So we literally doubled our revenue per customer while our conversion rates stayed the same. Right. So, and the, the trick was creating that anchor price point, that the most expensive plan that, that basically makes everything else look more valuable. Like, oh, it's 300 bucks, but for eight, just 89, it can get almost as much. Right. Uh, and there's also some crazy people that don't mind paying you the, the, the anchor price point. Yeah. So I think um, what I'd like to do now, we just have under eight minutes. Um, I'm banking on a super interactive crowd. Um, I hope you guys are it. Um, basically, what we want to do is we want to bring maybe two people on stage. We'll start with one. Um, well, how, first question, actually, how many of you guys have startups? OK, so there's a few startup people in here. Um, I guess, how many of you? Um, have, well, you know, want more growth? Do you, who wants more growth? <laughs> okay, okay, you know, this is good, this is good. Okay, so who wants to come up on stage and pitch their business for about 30 seconds, get some great exposure, and let us help you um, basically market, and, you know, what, what, what we would do if we were your CMO? Ra raise, raise your hand. All right. Okay, we're going to start with... Dude, I know I, we got introduced. Frank? Frank. Come up on stage, baby. Woo! Ladies and gentlemen. Hey, what's up? My name is Frank. I'm from New York City. And my company is called Startup Threads. We help companies design, print, and ship merchandise. So about a year and a half ago, I started with a subscription service, sending out t-shirts every month to cool you know, startup fans. Talked to a lot of companies about what they needed. And what I realized was that a lot of companies want to use merchandise as part of their marketing tools, and they don't really have a way to do that in the same way you do with you know, Google Analytics or any other part of your marketing plan. So I'm trying to help marketers use merchandise in this way. So we'll warehouse your stuff for you, ship it out, uh, send it to your customers, make them happy, hopefully, and maybe help with some of your retention and referral stuff. What's, uh, what are your biggest problems? Um, the biggest problem right Gro now... Growth-related. Not, not related. your personal problems. <coughs> Uh, we'd be there all day. Um, <laughs> probably the growth stuff is that right now it's a bit haphazard in finding companies. So usually, you know, I'll go to events and I'll meet people and they'll say, this is awesome, but 
finding that one consistent way of finding new companies that are interested in using it, that's probably the hardest part. Okay. Um, I, I just have a really quick one. Um, so you can mine Crunchbase, better said scrape Crunchbase, and do it by funding, et cetera. Uh, actually, I've, I did this a, a year or two ago, so I can send that over to you. I've been doing this on TechCrunch. I like oh, okay. see somebody gets funded and like, Oh, but you got to do it systematically, right? So yeah. you can literally, you should scrape the data from Crunchbase. I, I have a question. Are, um, like, who, who's, uh, I guess, your pilot customers or who, who's using it today? Um, so right now, Mixpanel uses it to ship out all their T-shirts. Um, they use the API for it. Constant Contact, um, a couple other random startups. So it's funny, because I went to your website. Is that on your website? Okay, so where on your website does it show that? Halfway down right now. <laughs> <laughs> Below the fold. So here we have, a, this is a typical example of a great, like so I, we got introduced by my friend Shane. Um, he's a C, he was a CEO of Startup Weekend. And uh, he's like, dude, you have this really cool company. And I checked out his website and I was like, I, the description was fucking cool. And then I got to the site and I was like, Number one, what do you guys do? Like, in plain English, what do you guys do? Number two, why do I care? Number three, give me some credibility. You know, like, if Mixpanel, I'm a paying customer in a Mixpanel. I love Mixpanel. Um, and, you know, if Mixpanel is using that, like, how do we get them to, A, showcase that they're using it? How do we get, you know, because credit, like, that credibility will, will, will take you from whatever it is you're doing now to, like, five times. And I think like you did a really really hard thing, which is getting those people bought into your um, into your company. Most people can't even do that. Um, so you did a really hard thing. Now that th you're, what your problem is is you're too humble. You're too humble. And I think as Canadians, if there's any Canadians in the room, Canadians are the worst at this. It's like, oh yeah, I have this startup and this is what we do. But we do like 45 million uniques a day. You know. <laughs> <laughs> you know. It's like okay, like. This is what you know. This is what we do. This is why we're great, and this is why you should care. And then, I think that's really important. So that's a quick one. So, so you, out of the, the the five step funnel, is your problem with acquisition? Yeah, acquisition. Because okay. once I find a company that has the pain point, like I'll talk to like a marketing manager or office manager, and they have to like go to the post office and ship out a bunch of T-shirts, and they hate doing that. It's pretty easy to convert right. them. Right. So you got to get that, and I can send you that file if you want. Yes, that would awesome. be awesome. Thank you. Cool. Um, honestly, go to startupthreads.com. It's the best fucking startup in the world. Um, thank you for coming up. We'll talk after. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Lauren. I'm from Flightfox. Uh, basically, we're crowdsourcing travel. Uh, so instead of searching online for hours or going to your local travel agent, uh, basically, you put up a contest, and we have thousands of flight experts and travel agents all around the world who compete against each other to find you the best trips and the best prices. So I know your service. I know it very well. In fact, so I book a lot of trips. Yeah. Sorry to hijack this one. Um, no pun intended on the... Uh, um, <laughs> sorry. Nice. Um, so... The, your, your problem, so I've been to your site, and you have a similar problem to him a bit, is that, and sorry to be so blunt, but you guys have an amazing service, it's an amazing idea, you know, like it's so annoying to book flights. It's really annoying, um, and. Is this like international, multi-city, anything complex? Like if you're commuting to San Francisco and back, like we're not for you, go to kayak. Where for anything that's international, yeah, anything complex, if you want to travel with your dog or whatever. Exactly, and like I think who you guys target really well, and it's a question that you guys have to ask, you know, when you're building your product and you're trying to communicate is, um, what type of people you want to target? And I think the type of people you target is, first of all, you target busy people um, who don't want to go through that trouble and want the best deal, and also people who are booking elaborate trips. I think what Uber did really well is that they have a very premium brand. Um, Uber, for the people who don't know, is like this like on-demand, uh, you know, car, you know, taxi or black car service. Um, I think what you guys, it's Flightfox. Yeah, I think what Flightfox is missing is that like premiumness. It's like, oh, you, like 
you don't use flight like I, like if Dario like Dario goes like oh dude you don't use flight box you actually manually go in and like you actually book like and that's what you do or like you know it's like no no it's like this is a premium thing it's worth the thirty five dollars because you're gonna save anyways and it's like I, you got it's another like communication issue um, so it's like the more premium you go I think um, the more clubby you make it feel um, the more people like. Uh, or over time. I thought I was going to blow. <laughs> um, yeah, so that, that, that would be my one quick feedback. Sorry. Uh, and Dimitri? Do, right. Um, probably, oh, thanks. Um, acquisition and activation. Mm. So at, at the moment, uh, what we found worked really well was if you come to the site and, and start a contest, but then, uh, so you have to pay a fee up front, so you pay like $30, $40 up front, um, but you know we're aiming to save you time and more money after that. Uh, but basically, if we if we send you an email 24 hours later and it's personalised for me, I'm like, hey, you want to go to San Francisco or Sydney? Um, you know what what do you need from me to convince you? And um, for some people, I give like a 25% off, and that converted like double the amount of people that came through the site just by that one email. The email that looks like it comes from you works wonders. Yeah. Amazing. Can I say one last thing? Because I'm gonna say one last. I, one, he'll say. Do you have any? Do you have any feedback for her? Uh, go ahead. Okay. What I want to say is, um, okay. Quickly, banner ads. Everyone thinks that they don't work because no one clicks on them. Truth is, they work because um, you know it depends what channel it is, right? And I think with your product, you have a product that people sell, so it's all about measuring lifetime value of a customer, etc. Okay. What you guys got to target is banner ad. So basically, you you can. You can basically get the information that if I'm searching, I can search from Montreal, let's say I'm booking a flight from Montreal to Shanghai on Expedia. Grab that data, come up with retargeting banner ads um, all across the internet on people who've already visited Flightbox. So I'm, I'm, a, I'm Greg, I go to flightbox.com, I don't sign up, or maybe I sign up. And then three months later, I'm on Kayak or Expedia, whatever. I go, I forget about Flightbox for whatever reason. And then I, I go and I see. I book that, I, I'm looking at trips, I'm in the process of whatever, and then I'm on yahoo.com slash videos, and I see a banner ad for, hey, like you should book with us. I would be doing a lot of banner retargeting that are based on information of travel, if you guys are not already. Yeah. Retargeting is amazing, and you have to be really smart about it, so yeah. make sure you segment your traffic differently, right? So if somebody spends, shut up, uh, two minutes on the site versus you know, 10 seconds, it makes a huge difference, and you should price that traffic differently. Yeah. Okay, great, thanks a lot, guys. Um, okay, that's it. Um, that's all, folks. Um, thank you for listening to a couple of growth hackers on a beautiful day. Um, I'm a big believer in, here's a growth hack, of course. We're obviously, we're going to pitch something. We're growth hackers, right? So I'm a big believer in what Sanebox is doing. Uh, go to sanebox.com if you, uh, you know, don't want a bunch of, you know, if you want to just focus on great emails and, and you know, get through that, that shit. And does everyone like watching videos sometimes? Yeah? <laughs> so 5 will show you only the videos you want to see. Cool. Thanks, guys.